Hi, it's Jen from Shabby Fabrics. These amazing hot pads are called the Folded Star Hot Pad. They have actually been out for years and I've been admiring them and I finally said it's time to tackle this project and learn how to make these amazing hot pads. And now that I've started, I can't stop. I've been making them in patriotic fabrics and just kind of the shabby chic look. And obviously you're seeing these, this is Tarrington here on the left, a uh, new collection coming out from Marcus Brothers. That'll be the one I'm demonstrating today. And if you're anything like me, you know, I'm primarily a quilter. I'm very comfortable with new quilt patterns, but when it comes to things like making a bag or maybe um, a garment, especially a garment, I'm like, oh, I'm not as confident. I don't have as much experience. This is another one of those things where I'm like, how do they do that? So this is to explain how the process works. So let's jump right into it. Um, this is an amazing designer, Deborah Miller, who owns Plum Easy Patterns. Bless her heart. She is, she's so skilled. She has a lot of patterns on the industry, in the industry today. And she makes some really innovative products, including this product. So we'll be using her, this kind of, it's kind of like an interfacing, so to speak, that we'll be uh, uh, putting our squares on and gluing it down and sewing it down. And I'll show you the whole process from start to finish. So again, getting back to Plum Easy Patterns, what Deborah has done is inside her pattern, you will get one of those um, it's not really a template. It's, it's an interfacing template, it looks like, is what she's calling it. You'll get one. But of course, these are completely addictive. You want to make more for yourself, and they're amazing as a housewarming gift. And of course, at Christmas time, Mother's Day, these are uh, wonderful gifts, and they're practical. They are nice and thick. You can use them and throw them right in the washing machine and keep using them. And if they get worn out, make some more. So what Deborah's done is she's also made the interfacing templates kind of, this is kind of the add-on packet. There's 12 in here. You'll only need to buy the pattern one time. And then as you want to make more and more hot pads, you'll just be buying the ref refill packet. And this particular one has 12 of those. So isn't that nice that you're able to make more of these without having to rebuy the pattern each time? How we're doing this as kits so let's say you want to buy the kit to make this specific one, or maybe this specific, specific tearing to one I'll be demonstrating today. Those kits will include all of your fabrics and one of the templates to do that. You'll need to be sure to buy that pattern, and that way you'll be able to buy one pattern and maybe multiple, excuse me, upside down there, multiple of the kits as you choose. So uh, let's jump into how we do this. Uh, of course, these interfacing template refills will also be on the website if you want to just use your own fabric. So I won't be going over specific measurements. Deborah's asked us to just maybe show you the process only without getting into the specifics of measurements. And so I'll make sure I honor that request that she has of me. And I'll show you the process though of how these go together. They look complicated, but they're so fun and so easy to make and you can get one done in just a couple hours. This is a longer video. Be sure to um, hang in there with me and it'll be worth it. So when you jump into making your first hot pad, it's going to make it just so much easy, uh, easier and fun because you've been able to see me demonstrate that to you. But of course, you'll be referring to the pattern for those specific sizes of cuts, uh, but I'll be going through all the other processes. So the first thing that we're going to do, as you may notice here, is you need to choose your layering of fabric. Um, as you can see from the hot pad here and the patriotic, you've got a center star and you have three other layers and then a binding and you also have your backing as well. So you'll be choosing your fabrics if you're not going to be buying a kit where we've already chosen those for you. So first thing that we'll do, we'll be making this one right here that's on my right, your left is we'll start off with a center square that we'll just put in the center of that template. And it, she does such a great job, or it says just center square there. Now I recommend that you go ahead and put an applique pressing sheet down, or maybe even wax paper, because we are gonna be using some glue. And it's going to naturally seep through the template. I don't have that with me today, so I'll just go ahead and use a little bit of glue, but, um, Again, when I've been making these, I do have at home, I have a piece of wax paper underneath there, 
In the sewing room, I used my applique pressing sheet, the really slick one from Fonz and Porter, and that glue just kind of rolls off later on once it dries. I've got two different glues, same company, different applicators. Roxanne's Glue Basta is my go-to glue for really everything. It also washes out, it's water soluble, I love that. The first time I ever washed this, if I ever wash it, or maybe you just wanna use it for decorative purposes and maybe never use it, you don't need to worry about that. You don't need to remove that glue, but just know that if you do wash it, that will wash away. Now with the original Roxanne's Glue Basta, you're getting a smaller amount of glue out of the tip. With her other um, style that's come out later, you have two options. This end and kind of that dabbing. I won't be using the dabbing end, but I think I'll be using this end and it'll help me move a little bit quicker with you today. But this will be your preference. Just know if you're gonna use the larger kind of barrel one, it does come out faster, so be careful. For the center square, I'm just gonna put some dabs of glue in my four corners and just scent that right exactly into my center square. Now for everything else, we will also be using squares, but we'll be folding them. So let's jump right into that right now. And what, whatever size square the pattern calls for, it's the same process to prepare it. Now I used a lot of sizing in my fabrics because I wanted them to hold that crease for me while I sew everything together in the sewing machine. So if that's new to you, just pick up that magic sizing. It's available at all of the, just Walmart, Joann's, your local grocery store will have it, kind of in that laundry section. It's like a dollar and something a can. Use that liberally so that this fabric has a lot of body and whenever you are pressing it, it's going to hold that press. And you want your iron on full hot on this and I'll be using my wool pressing mat, which I love. So I've got my square. We're going to fold that in half exactly. One thing I wanna emphasize about this is the folding and pressing is, needs to be very precise for the hot pad to work out properly. And for all of these rows to line up so that they just have that beautiful star effect. So fold that in half. Don't be afraid to steam that. Really just make that, that stay there. Now we'll fold that corner in. I wanna get my head out of the way so you can see that. So that that is exactly 90 degrees and that fabric is running right along that bottom continuing that visual line. What I do when I prepare these, I'm just gonna put that there and I, I kinda of let the iron just be there. On my wool pressing mat, I can leave that iron there for so long. I kind of let it just be there. In the meantime, I'm taking my next fabric, folding it in half, and then I move my iron to it. So I can just kind of, in sequence, keep going. And it allows my iron to be there for a period of time. Once that fold is there, I'm gonna fold the other side down, making sure I have that nice point. And again, I'm running right along that visual line, and I'm gonna let that iron be there. I'll let that sit there while I get the next one that maybe is like this, and then I fold that over. I'm allowing that iron to sit there and really just set those points and create a nice strong crease. I'm gonna press that even a little more. I don't want that going anywhere. Perfect, okay. So now, that's how you will prepare all of your layers. So let's jump back into what's next. Let's take a look at, at Deborah's template here. So the next layer that'll come in, see that line right here? If I line up the visual center, you can see that fold with this, with the kind of saddle, the very bottom. Can you see that? Hopefully you can see that up, up above. I'll move that. So that, that line just continues here. And I'm gonna move it down till it intercepts where it says layer one. Notice how it also lines up with these coming in on the diagonals. That's the perfect spot. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna turn that over let me dab my corners. Okay, 
So we're going to go back to, just like we lined up, we're lining up the center portion with our vertical and then bringing it into this diagonal so it kind of sits right in that little saddle. Just like that. So what we'll be doing, if you can visualize that, is we're coming in and really repeating that process. See how that one's lining up with this one, lining up with the diagonals, repeating that for here and here, and here and here, just like that. So you're kind of building that center. That's the very center portion here. So let me quickly do that, get that glued down. And you know, you can, if you know where everything is going, and we do, we can kind of put that glue on all at once, and then just go, go, go. As usual, I'm always trying to find a quicker way to do something because I want to make more of them <laughs> in a short amount of time. So I'm lining up here with my diagonals. I don't think I have enough glue on that one right there. I definitely don't want things coming apart while I'm sewing everything down. Line up there. Nice. And of course, these points should be right across from each other because you want to have that visual line that it just extends from one seamlessly into the next. Perfect. All right, that's our first layer. There's one change that happens. We're going to repeat this process but instead of it only being four squares, there'll be eight. And the other step I want to emphasize is on the very first square, or triangle, excuse me, that I put down, which will now be on this next layer, actually layer two here, see how it says layer two, where it curves around and intercepts that line, that's the bottom. And we're wanting to visually line this up with the one ahead of it. That's your, that's your guidance. Just like in flying, I have guidance to the left and right and up and down. This is the same way. I have, I have <laughs> guidance this way, and I have guidance this way. I'm looking to make sure I'm equidistant from this line, and that I'm lining up from this square, excuse me, triangle that became, square became a triangle, into this one. So I want to make sure that I'm not only looking here and here, because you see how these aren't flowing in the same direction. You want to be checking that, that alignment is what I would call it. The difference is, remember how we put glue and here and here on both of those? On the very first square, you'll only put glue on the right one for now. You'll see why here shortly. So let's line that up. Looking at all my points, here, there, there, and I'm lined up with my green. Beautiful. Now I know where these next ones are going to go, so I am actually going to line them up like this. I'm going to put the glue on, and this is just going to save me time from doing one at a time and picking up the glue and dropping the glue. Now you're not going to want to do this if you're not ready to put them down right now. So if you think you're about to be maybe interrupted, baby's about ready to wake up, you might want to put the glue on one by one because this glue will dry and then it might be a real pain to get that back off. All right, we're coming into this corner now. Remember how this was my, this was my layer two? This is my layer two arc. Now my alignment is still at the bottom, running with this in line with that one. Next one. I'll just keep that out here so you can see it. This is my arc, my layer two arc right there, and that's going to be the bottom, right? We said that's going to be the bottom. We're lining this up right here. This looks equidistant to me. Everything is great. Let's keep going. Layer two.
And our stars quickly coming together. Notice how each one overlaps the next on the corner. You're going to quickly see why we had to not put glue on this corner, or as we come around, we wouldn't have been able to tuck the edge under. Okay, we're getting almost to that spot. How fun is this? Okay, it's this one that I'm not gonna go just on top, I'm gonna lift this edge up my layer two, lining this up. I'm going to press that down. Now I go back and put a little bit of glue here so that I put that overlaps the other one. So again, I'll start the next layer and then I'll do the rest off camera and kind of quickly get us there. So just like before, we're now at layer three, right? See layer three? There's where it intercepts. You'll be looking for that point at, all around as you put the next layer down, which is the exact same process, making sure that with our very first triangle, we're only putting glue at first on the right side only, all the sides, both sides, all the way around. And then remember, as you come around to put this next one, last one down, that you would put glue on both, and then you'd lift this up, layering that, and then put that down. So let me go do that off camera. Maybe I'll do it real time with you, actually. And we'll just speed up the footage. How about that? That way you're seeing it happen in real time. So now look at it, look at our hot pad already. Isn't that so cool? Now, of course, we've got a little bit of that glue coming underneath. You've got a couple choices if you do have an applique pressing sheet underneath that. You could, you know, take that, turn that over, take that to your pressing mat. I am going to go ahead and bring, mine's mostly dry. I was pretty, didn't use very much glue. Now I just want to get everything good and flat. Make sure everything is exact, nothing's moved. A couple of those moved just a little bit on me there. And now I'm just going to press everything. For this next step, I'll be using a clear thread in my machine. You may want to increase your stitch length. And I recommend using an 8012 super non-stick needle because you are going through so many layers and because we've got some glue here. So. I like to make sure I've got the right needle in for the job I will be doing. And, you know, I, depending on what you're piecing with or what your last project was, you might need to, to re examine what is on um, your machine. But this is the Schmatt Super Nonstick. We use these for any time we're using a machine applique where fusible webbing is involved or glue is involved. So these are just a great thing to have in your sewing room. That's what I've got in my machine right now. And because I'm going to be using the clear thread here, I've turned my tension down. It just seems like the monofilament thread, the clear, it's of course not a cotton, it's a man-made thread. It's got a certain stretchiness to it. And by turning the tension down, 
I, it just seems to work a lot better. I've dialed the tension down to almost half. Go ahead and play around with that on your machine, maybe with some scrap fabric, some bulky scrap fabric as you sew through. Um, I've got uh, some of a black I, ha I think I have in the bobbin. And what we'll be doing here, I definitely want to get a close-up of that. I'll explain what I'm going to be doing before I do it. Sometimes it's a little bit easier. I'll be using a couple tools to assist me as well. This is the Hold It Precision Stiletto from Clover. This tool is invaluable and it keeps your fingers away from those areas where you might otherwise be tempted to put your finger in to hold the fabric down. So what we'll be doing, I'm going to raise this presser foot real quick so you can see what, what's about to happen, is we're going to start, you can start really anywhere, and I'm going to start I'll just start at the top. I'm going to move that flap out of the way and I'm just going to be paralleling this, not sewing on it, but sewing right next to it. Right through, I want to kind of line those up. If you need to, if you need to move something, adjust something, go ahead and do that right now. If you need to kind of adjust anything, let's just do that so that you know, hey, what, what happens if it shifts or maybe I didn't get it straight? Just lift up the glue make the adjustment. You might need to re-glue an area. That's fine. But we want to be able to go from here, right through here, right onto here, through here, and continue coming up. This is going to be what my tool will be as I hold pieces down as my pressure foot approaches. Otherwise, the pressure foot is going to make this flip back. This tool helps me hold this in place. This other end we won't be using today. This is another wonderful tool for opening seams that may be otherwise difficult to open. And this, this, this uh, tempered kind of rubber tip is heat resistant, so it's not going to melt with your iron. So let's just get started. Picture's worth a thousand words. You'll see, see how this goes so beautifully. So let's get going. And I'm going to move that flap back right now. I'm going to lift that up because I don't want to be on my fabric. See how that went in my fabric? We don't really want that. Let's move that out of the way. We'll start right next to it. Okay. So let's get started. And I'm going to make sure that that doesn't shift on me so I get everything lining up beautifully. So that starts to move, I can just move that over and say, nope, get over there. Now as I jump across to the other side where the points are going this way and they want to flip, I'm going to hold that right there until the pressure foot has it. Turn my speed down just a little bit. This is nothing you want to zoom around with because you want to get those just so. See how that does that so beautifully? I'm not tempted to do this, which is dangerous. I have put a needle through my finger before and that was not fun. Now here, I'm going to lift up my pressure foot, but leaving my needle down, I'm going to open that. That way, when I get going, it's easier for me to just sew along here and I don't have to worry about catching that. You don't want that mono, monofilament thread, which kind of has a shine. You don't want that on the top of your thread. With needle down, I'll now, and I'm going to raise that needle and my presser foot. Oops, I actually cut my thread. I didn't mean to do that, but that's fine. What I was going to do is just lift up and pivot around and start again here, but we'll start here anyway. Let's just start right there. I'll move the flap again, and here we go. Now, Deborah also mentions the option of as you put a layer down, you sew it down. So that's something you could do. We found it a little bit easier and a little bit faster to sew it all together in the end. But just know that's one of the options she mentions in her pattern. Now, 
now that I'm onto my last fabric, again, I will raise the presser foot, move that one flap, the one on the right, out of the way, and let's continue sewing right along the other flap. You can, of course, just cut your thread, or if you want to, just raise your presser foot, raise your needle. Just pull out a little bit gently, because sometimes that monofilament likes to break. You have to be a little more gentle with it. Now we just go down the next row and continue sewing. That's, an, that's just an option. It doesn't really save you anything. Um, it's just an option. Now I'll get that right out of the way, right, right out of the chute there. Let's continue sewing. See how I can direct that point? If that point wants to kind of move off, I can say, nope, stay right there. So it's all lined up perfectly as best as we can. See how that wants to, there we go. Just lift it up, line it up, use this if you need to. The foot I'm using today is a 97D, if you happen to have a Bernina. This is a super foot to just you probably already have it, but in case you don't, just be sure to pick that one up. Let me move that flap out of the way real quick. And again, I can just raise my needle, raise my foot, and I'll come around to the next point. And you'll continue until you've done that through each place and everything is stitched down. I'm going to adjust that one. I'll re-glue that side. Here we go. There's a perfect example of me saying no. You're, you're not going, that point's not going over there. We're going to keep it over here. And I'm just going to hold that there. that up. And if need be, if you need to lift up your needle, there you go. And I'm on a slightly longer stitch length as well doing this because I'm going through so much fabric. I've not only reduced my tension, I've increased my stitch length a bit. I'm at 2.75 right now if you happen to be sewing in a Bernina. I'm just going to adjust this one real quick. I don't think that flap is quite right. See how you just kind of finesse this as you go. And if you need to re-glue certain edges, you can. And you don't have to do that at this moment. Let's lift up that flap. I think I might have done them all. Let's double check. Sometimes. It's hard to do it when I'm standing. I can't really see all the way around the project. Let's see, have we gotten all of them? The quickest way is to turn the project over and say, did I sew down all those lines? And it looks like we have. So let's come back to the front. I'm going to re-glue those couple areas I made adjustments to. Isn't this such a fun project? And the more you do it, the quicker this becomes. Put a little bit of glue down there. That, that was one of the ones I wanted to re-glue. There we go. So anything that's not laying perfectly flat, you don't like that, notice how I can just lift that up and re-glue it. No big deal. Plus, we're going to go back soon, and we're going to stitch this down and kind of quilt it, so to speak. But if something has a little bit of a bubble, I just lift it up and re-glue it. 
just make sure that over and under that you get that sequence right. Like we were laying that down, the next one goes, this is under that, and this is under that, that you keep that sequence going. Okay, any other areas you see that you want to fix, go ahead and fix them. And once you're satisfied with that, the next step, now I'm going to go ahead and repress. Um, the next step will be, we're done with our mon monofilament, and now I'll be using this to stitch along the back. I'll be stitching on my circle, exactly on my circle. I'll take my stitch length back to a normal stitch length, or you can leave it at the 2.75. Probably either will work just fine. Um, and then we will be trimming, and then we're going to be doing some quilting so that we'll be securing all of this down. So let me change out of my mono, uh, monopoly thread, and I'm going to be bringing my tension back to normal. And when I come back, the machine will be ready to go, and we will go on to the next steps. So we're at the point now we're going to flip this over. And as I mentioned, that circle, we're going to now sew directly on that. My monopil monofilament's gone. I have a regular cotton thread on there. And I'm just going to sew on that line. Okay, so now we've got everything stitched down. Now I noticed on a couple of the ones I've done where my fabric maybe didn't extend all the way and I missed it just a little bit, don't worry about that. Everything's going to be just fine. Um, the next step is to cut. So I'm going to be using my Karen K. Buckley scissors. I love these. They're super sharp. I'm recently introduced to these scissors. I'm going to cut not on my stitch line because of course I'd undo what I just did, but about an eighth of an inch to the outside of that. So I'm just going to, I think actually like a 16, just, just miss that thread basically and continue that same distance all the way around. Make sure that all of your, um, that anything that you didn't secure, you don't want that to roll back and inadvertently cut that. So any area that maybe you didn't catch in your thread, just, just be careful there. Let's cut that out. Okay, starting to look like a hot pad already, right? We're getting so close. Now our next step, we'll be taking a piece of batting and a piece of backing, and you'll just layer those together, of course, with the right side being face down. You're batting on top, and we'll just position this together. And our next step, we'll be taking this to our sewing machine. Now you want to analyze your, your fabric. You'll be doing a little bit of top uh, quilting, stitching, an eighth of an inch, just paralleling this line. You know, really, you could add your personality here if you want to do some beautiful decorative stitches and, and be more elaborate with metallics, go for it. Those might not be hot pads you ever want to use. They're more for display, and that's fine. But the pattern has you sewing an eighth of an inch just paralleling that. So let's go do that now. Now decide if you want to have coordinating thread that just blends in or thread that you want to kind of show off. I've chosen a gold, I want it to show up. So let's start here with a, I'm just gonna pick along a side and this particular presser foot, I'm gonna be looking right here. I'm just going to get started here. If you have a needle down option, you're going to want to pick that and see how I, mine's not on. I'm going to put that there. That's my pivot point. So I'll lift and I'm going to pivot, keeping this edge on this side of my particular presser foot. Really, the main thing is to keep whatever distance you do here, keep it the same. If you want a quarter of an inch, do a quarter of an inch. 
Now past this seam, I'm going to go two stitches. One, two. Oop. Let me back up just to touch and go needle down. I thought I was needle down there. Now let me pivot. And that should put me in a perfect position to come down here. we go. Back up this way. Two stitches. One more. Stop and pivot. One, two, pivot. One more, right? <laughs> Sometimes it's like, whoop, I went a little too far on that one. So in this case, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut my thread. I'm going to seam rip that. This is nothing I expected to do on camera with you today, but as you know about me, what do you do when that happens? Let's deal with that, right? I want to talk about the reality of what that, what, that, what that means. I'm just going to go back, seam ripping a couple stitches, so that I can begin stitching again. I might go back a little bit further, because I already know I'm going to take one stitch forward and one stitch back to lock that in. So let's get started again. Don't feel like you have to seam rip everything out. You don't. Let's establish our spot to make sure we're going to start right where we want to start. Let's go needle down. And I'll be ready to take a stitch forward and one back. And let's come down right into that corner again. One stitch this time. There. <laughs> and let's pivot. If you have a speed control in your machine, you might want to turn it down just so you don't inadvertently have that happen. I'm going to turn mine all the way down as well. Maybe a little bit quicker. There. One, two. One more stitch. There we go. I didn't go too past, did I? Let me get relined up here where I was coming from. Got all excited. There's my two. Now pivot. I'm just excited to finish this up. <laughs> These are so fun. Like I said, they're totally addicting to make. One more. There we go. And of course, you want to intercept that so it has a nice visual. You're just running right into it. Backstitch once or twice. All done. And let's just look at what we've done. Even with that little mistake, I seem ripped out. Let me trim this so you can see, get a good, nice close up. Because this is fresh off the ironing board, right? Or off the uh, sewing machine, rather. See how pretty that is? You know, it's just, even where I, I think I made that uh, correction right there, you really kind of can't tell. So don't worry. If you overstitch 
and end up, oops, just same rep back like you saw me do, restart, anchor that, and keep going. All right, let's move over to the next step. So the next step is to, again, cut. Go ahead and use those wonderful scissors that you have to cut right along where you already cut before. Just know that this cut here, as well as the previous one that we did with the scissors, is really the shape that you're going to have. That the binding will be placed around this shape. So you do want to make sure it's nice and round. You take some time to cut carefully to get that nice round shape. And for those ends that are out here like this, don't worry. Once we put our binding on, um, that, all of that's going to lay down nicely. So no worries about that. All right, the next step with our hot pad is actually two things. And you can make a decision of whether or not you think you're going to want the hanger. The hanger is it's a nice option to have if you think you ever want to display the hot pads when they're not being used. Or maybe you plan to never use this. It's more of a decorative thing. I'll show you how to make the hanger. But if you're like, nope, I'm going to use these as hot pads. I'm never going to hang them up. You can skip this step. But let me go ahead and jump into that. Now, because you're going to be going around a circular shape, we need bias binding. And that's the bias binding. If you're not a quilter, you might not be familiar with the term. What that is is that the, the fabric that goes around the edge of the hot pad is called a binding. And fabric that is on grain, whether it's across the width of the fabric or down the length of the fabric, doesn't have as much stretch as fabric that is cut on the 45 uh, angle to those two grains. So if I have a piece of fabric here, I would cut it 45 degrees and it has stretch. So I've cut a piece of binding ahead of time as well as my strip for my hanger. And I just want to show you how stretchy it is. And it's going to be folding beautifully around the edge of our um, hot pad. But let's go ahead and jump into the hanger first because the hanger is something we will incorporate into the hot pad as we're before we actually sew the binding on. So you'll have your strip. It's, uh, again, the measurements will be included into the pattern. And the first thing I'll be doing is just ironing that directly in half. I want to have a nice crease there. My iron's still heating up. So I have my nice crease. And what I'll be doing is folding my edges to that crease and pressing again. And I'll do the same out here, pressing toward the middle again. And then press, and then, so I have those two toward the middle, and now fold in half, like that. Just fold in half. And give a really good press. When you choose your thread, as I'm thinking of it, because I know that this is now going to come into play, because I'm going to be top stitching on either side of that a very sh short, maybe eighth of an inch, that's where you want to start thinking about the thread. I have kind of a yellowish gold on the top, because I did my top quilting. And then on the back, or on the bobbin, I have a black. So I'm going to go ahead, if you wanted to make sure to have gold on both sides or whatever color, you'd want to take that into account now because you are going to go ahead and see that thread. I'm okay um, with this being gold on the top and black on the bottom. So let's go ahead to the machine. Now I'm going to use a starter strip. Anytime I have a piece this small going into my machine, sometimes my machine likes to uh, kind of, it, it's, it's, as, it's more difficult to get going um, with just smaller pieces. And that's where I find a starter strip just helps the machine get going, get established. And then I come in right thereafter with the fabric and I have a more likely nice uh, stitch parallel to the edge versus it kind of wandering around. So with a starter strip, it's just a scrap piece of fabric.
I just get the machine going. And then I'm going to come in right afterwards so it just goes from the starter strip directly onto the fabric. And it's a, it's a more seamless transition. trim that starter strip and I'm going to repeat the process down the other side. Okay, there's our little hanging tab. So let's put that binding aside for the moment. Now this confused me just a touch visually, so I want, I want to show you this step and, and save you some trouble. It seemed to work best when I folded this in half like this, put it onto, so I kind of established where my center was. That's my primary reason for folding it. That, and I kind of push it. You could even, if you wanted to, you could press that on your iron. Then I open it like this. And I press it at the top so it, it's under, it kind of makes this at the top. So again, fold in half. Maybe we will we'll put a little press in there. Open it like this and tuck that under. So it makes this little, what I call a delta. And now I'm gonna press that. So let's, let's turn this one over so you can see here. So that, that kind of opening, because once, once it's up, we want it to be displayed like that, right? So you'll flip this over, and you, of course, want to take into consideration, do you want what, what side you want up? If, there, if you have a preference for what's upright, one thing you want to make sure of is that it's, you have this V being straight up. So you see this little gap right here of these two flaps? You're going to want to make sure that on the opposite side, that is right across from this gap here. Otherwise, if this was here, it would hang lopsided. So take, the, take your time to make sure that you are lined up. See, I'm not lined up. Finesse that and you if you kind of look down at the project I can see these two and I can see these two and I'm kind of lining them up Just like so Yep, let's go stitch that down I'm gonna hold that good and tight and stitch and back stitch a couple times an eighth of an inch Now before I move on to put the binding on, show you how to prepare the binding, I'm going to flip this up and say, okay, if I were to display it, is it going to hang properly? If it's not, seam rip it and do it again. Because the last thing you want is to do the binding and then discover that and now you're just seam ripping more things out. So if you're happy with that, let's go ahead and move on to how to prepare the binding. Of course, we're doing our strip this way and she'll give you the measurements of the minimum length that you'll need. Let me move things out of the way because we're going to be pressing the strip. 
So her first instruction inside the pattern is showing you, this is the wrong side, that we'll be, um, move the, let me move this as a group off to the right so you can see what I'm doing. Takes a little bit of space here. She wants us to go ahead and turn that down by a quarter inch seam. Sometimes it's hard to go, well, what's a quarter inch seam? Well, Clover has come up with this hot ruler. We've used it before. I love this ruler. I can put my iron on this thing all day long and it's not going to melt it. There aren't too many rulers out there that I can touch with an iron that aren't damaging, melting that ruler. This was specifically meant for that purpose. So before I press that down, notice she has a 45 degree. This is my strip here and then she has a 45 degree angle. So I need to make sure that I take my ruler and I'm going to trim that to a 45 degree angle going this way. So depending on how you cut your bias strips, it might already be at a 45 or you might have to trim it. In this case, mine isn't already like that. Let me look at the other end. It might be ready to go. Nope. Yeah, another one of them. So that's fine. So that's when I'll take that 45 degrees that I rarely use on my ruler and I'm just going to lay it on there. And that's how I know I have the best bias. Bias is really anything that's off grain, you're on bias. But the truest bias, the stretchiest bias is on the 45 because that's the most bias you can have. So I'm going to trim that. And so now my strip looks like what's here in the pattern. All right. Her step one of making our binding, besides getting the strip long enough on bias and, and in this uh, configuration, is folding that edge down by a quarter inch. And this is why I love to use this hot press ruler. I'm going to use that for another starter strip later. Let's save those scraps. They're just, they're just starter strips waiting to happen, right? So let's look at our quarter inch. Right there, we have quarter inch, half inch, three quarter. That's great. So depending on what project you're doing, you don't have to like guess where that is. So I'm just going to lay that down and roll that edge over until it touches the quarter inch seam. Love this tool. I love that Clover products solve problems. You know what I'm saying? Some uh, notions are out there, they're, um, Time savers for sure, and definitely a lot of Clover products are time savers, but they're also problem solving tools because I've never been able to accurately get that quarter inch seam allowance. And here with this tool, I can, or a half inch, or three quarters, or, 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 and that's nice. Especially when you're trying to make it even. All right, let me press that all the way down. We are so close to getting our, hold this to our hot pad done, and then you are going to want to make another one, and another one, and another one. And it's fun. Think about doing these for each season, right? To kind of do something fun and different in the kitchen. Um, it's just kind of fun to celebrate holidays and seasons, because gosh, no, we sure have them here in Idaho. We have four seasons, that is for sure. All right. So that was our first step. Second step, oh, I got that a little bit too bold, I think. I got a little excited trying to get my hot pad done here. Let me redo that edge right there. I think I got a little generous on my quarter. I can so generous of a quarter inch seam allowance. I don't know if there's any of you out there as well. I have never had in the history of my quilt blocks a block ever come out bigger <laughs> than it was supposed to often smaller because I take a generous quarter inch seam allowance versus the correct quarter inch seam allowance. Hopefully I'm not the only one out there that does that. Let me just scoot that back there. There we go. Yes, I was just getting a little generous there with my quarter inch seam. There we go. Okay. And you can steam. Don't be afraid to really just get in there and put a lot of heat into that crease. That 
ruler just holds up and holds up and it just performs. All right, we've got the top done. Now she wants us to do the same. Let's, where's that quarter inch again? Let's see here. Here we are. Down here at the end, we're going to fold that over by a quarter of an inch as well. Let's give that a good press. And then as you turn that over, you see that little dog ear there? Go ahead and just trim that away. All right. So we're going to take this now. We could even start, you can start anywhere you want. There is no specific area that you need to start. You can pin it. You can just go for it. I have just found just going. Pinning is, is very difficult. You're going through so many layers. You could use your Wonder Clips now. I actually use my Wonder Clips later. I'm not going to pin this. Let's go to the sewing machine and you'll see how I work this through. We're using a standard quarter inch seam allowance now. We're back to those that familiar space. We know our quarter inch seam allowance. If you have a presser foot that has a gate on it, out here, this is a great time to use it. It rides beautifully along, along the edge. I don't have that one with me today, so I'll just continue using the same presser foot. So we'll just get that started. Be sure to back stitch as you normally would. And I just take it slowly, and as I go, the fabric just naturally, it naturally will go around that arc without you really pulling very hard at all. You don't want to, you don't want to really crank that fabric around. There's just not a need to do that. I just kind of stop and kind of just every couple stitches, just kind of work your way around. See that area that, that I didn't catch before with the basting stitch? I just got my finger on that and it's going to get all secured right now. Now as we come closer to the end, one thing I want to point out, so you're looking for what's to come. Notice this, of course, is on our 45. We want to sew an inch past this point, not this point. So when I first made my first hot pad, I was thinking an inch past here. No, it's an inch past here. So we'll, we'll continue sewing this strip on, overlapping this, and probably stopping right about in this area. So you know what I'm going to be doing and why I'm doing it. Right about here is where we'll stop. I'll just put my finger right there. Let's back stitch and let's cut our thread there. So that's what our hot pad looks like right now. Now what do we do with this extra bit? You just trim it away. So let's uh, just do a straight, make sure you're not catching anything else. It's only that fabric. It can just be cut straight up. And you just lift this up and it just tucks in there. Just tucks in there beautifully. It just nests. Now, we just roll this to the back, and this is where the Wonder Clips come in. I love the Wonder Clips. It rolls to the back. These are so much fun. Oh my gosh. Just an absolute blast to make. Isn't that so pretty? 
So let's start around here. Now, pattern says to go ahead and stitch that down by hand. I've went ahead and done it by machine because I plan to use my hot pads and I know that anytime I do a machine binding, um, it's just a little stronger than if I do it by hand and it's faster. So I roll mine around to the back, you know, nice and tight. So when I am stitching in the ditch here, which we will do together, I make sure I catch that fabric in the back. So I am definitely rolling that to the back and clipping with the flat side of the wonder clip to the bottom. So let's grab that one. Kind of where they join, there's a little bulk of course. That's fine, you just have to finesse that area. And you know, if you, I would rather you put your wonder clips a little bit closer than too far apart. So we'll continue to clip all the way around. Wrap that under. Just kind of have to finesse that spot right there. There you go. And we'll clip that a couple times. Now, because I'm stitching on black thread in the ditch, I would normally stitch with a black thread on the top now, as well as in the bottom. Well, I might even do the gold on the bobbin now because that's going to be the backside. But just for our purposes, I'll go ahead and keep the thread that I currently have. But it's just, I just wanted to mention you may want to consider changing thread at this point. Um, that's, that just depends because before, on the star, we wanted to show off our stitches. Now we want them to be hidden. That's why you would consider potentially using a different color than how we stitched before. All right, let's stitch in the ditch. And I'm gonna pull that fabric back so that thread just sinks right in there. Let's see how well we can hold, or kind of hide, I should say, this thread. I just kind of open this up with my fingers. Don't go fast here. So look, let's see how we did. Um, and if you have trouble um, with machine, by, again, do it by hand if you want to. If you're like, I'm not comfortable with that stitch in the ditch stuff, just do it by hand. It's not a big deal, it's not a long distance. If you're gonna be using that, just take more frequent stitches. So if, and we caught our, our binding just fine. If you find you're missing the binding, you wanna do it by machine, you could always maybe make your binding strip just like an eighth of an inch wider. You have just a little bit of extra to roll to the back and that way you're not missing. And so we've got that caught and we have our hot pad. These are, these are so much fun. Guys, I, you know, I, I, I love quilting, I love crafting, and it's fun to learn something else that incorporates elements of quilting, and, but it's yet not a quilt. And so I hope you enjoyed learning how to make these as much as I enjoyed showing you how to do that. I know it's been a longer video. Thank you so much for hanging in there. If you haven't already subscribed to our channel, be sure to do that. I have a lot more things I can't wait to show you, and I'll see you next time on another Shabby Fabrics video.